Um, so a few, a few preliminary remarks. Um, the talk is titled Islamic Constitutionalism, and that raises the question, what do we mean by constitutionalism? Yesterday we heard Matthias Herding's talk on constitutionalism, and uh, what I will speak about here today is certainly not the constitutionalism in the sense of what we heard yesterday. So um, I will not talk about systems where you have an independent judiciary, a separation of powers, where fundamental rights permeate the entire legal order. One could talk about constitutionalism along these lines in the Muslim world, for sure. Uh, so if we look at Indonesia, at uh, Tunisia, at uh, Mali, Senegal, you do have constitutional systems that would fit, I would argue, um, the sense of constitutionalism as Matthias <coughs> Nerding pr proposed it yesterday, uh, but those are not Islamic constitutional systems. Those are constitutional systems in Muslim-majority countries. Um, um, that brings us to the question, uh, what is the status of religious law in the legal system? Briefly speaking, you can say there are three types in the Muslim world. There are some legal systems that have no religious law whatsoever. Turkey would be an example. The, in 1924, the entire legal system was secularized. Also in the Central Asian republics that were um, formed under the Soviet Union, where law was secularized under the Soviet Union. Today, you have predominantly secular legal systems. However, the largest part of the type that we find in the Muslim world are uh, legal systems where you have Islamic law and family law, right? So we have 53 Muslim-majority countries in the world. About 40 of these have Islamic law and family law. Um, so uh, uh, custody, divorce, um, uh, issues, typical family law issues are dealt with uh, on the basis of Islamic law. And of course, you find this not only in a number of Muslim countries, you also find it in a number of non-Muslim countries, right? So we talked about Israel this morning. Israel has, of course, Islamic law and family law for the Muslim community. In India, it is similar. In Greece, uh, uh, the, the Muslim minority is also subject to Islamic law. Uh, it's still a remnant from the Ottoman Empire. So the, the type of law that Turks are actually not subject to today are, is still a type of law that the um, Muslim minority in Greece is subject to. And Ghana would be another example where you have a non-Muslim majority country that, however, applies Islamic-based family law to the Muslim community. Then you have a third category where Islamic law is actually part of public law. And that is where Islamic constitutionalism comes in. Um, the first group is one where um, Islam is uh, recognized as the religion of the state. That, that does not make it necessarily an Islamic constitutionalist country, right? Um, that could be a rather symbolic appreciation. Tunisia has a rather vague formulation, for example, in its constitution where it says Islam is the religion of the country, of Tunisia. It actually it doesn't say the country, it says just Tunisia. Islam is the religion of Tunisia. So it's not clear whether we should understand Tunisia here as, re as, as representing the country or the state. Um, certainly, Islamic public law in Tunisia is not based on Islamic law. So you have a number of countries where uh, Islam is the religion of the state, and that, of course, can be quite similar to the establishment uh, of uh, the Anglican Church in England or Sweden that un until 2000 had uh, the Lutheran Church as the state church. Finland until today actually has two, two state churches, the Lutheran and the Christian Orthodox Church. So this could be a rather symbolic um, appreciation of Islam. Then there are 12 constitutions since 1989 um, and seven before that declare Islamic law as a source or the main source of legislation. And you may all remember that this was a major bone of contention in the Egyptian revolution, right? So after President Mursi was elected president, uh, the, the Muslim Brother Constitution acknowledged, as the previous one had, that Islam would be the most important source of law. But what was new in the Egyptian Muslim Brothers Constitution is that an article was added that um, said parliament has to consult with the council at Al-Assar, so with the council of religious scholars at Al-Assar. Uh, that was again done away with after the military coup uh, in Turkey, uh, sorry, in Egypt. So Islam remains the main source of legislation in Egypt. However, this mechanism of how Islamic law is brought into the legislative process has been done away with again, which of course doesn't, uh, yeah, w w which doesn't speak at all about the authoritarian versus democratic character of the system. That is a completely unrelated question. Uh, it's, a, it's a very authoritarian system today. Then you have. Um, uh, uh, countries that call themselves Islamic states in their constitutions. And these, these are the ones where you have the greatest sort of commitment to integrate Islamic law into the public law. These are Pakistan, Iran, Saudi Arabia, Yemen, Afghanistan, and Mauritania. 
Um, and, and what is very important to bear in mind here is that each single one of these is very different for two reasons. One is that the um, predominant legal order that was installed during the colonial time, if these countries were colonized, has had a great bearing on how law is practiced today. The other is that the Islamic legal traditions are completely different within these, right? So in Yemen, you have a combination of communist in the south, British common law in the north, combined with Hanbali elements of, uh, of Islamic law. In Mauritania, you have the French legal system that was installed in the 1960s that was then imbued with Maliki elements because Maliki is the, the Sunni school of law that is predominant in Mauritania. Uh, so the French legal system that was then imbued with Maliki elements in the 1990s. In Saudi Arabia, you have a system that is uh, at, at one end of the extreme of all of these in the sense that there really is no codification of Islamic law. So if you have a legal uh, a court case in Saudi Arabia, what you will find is that the judge who presides will take out the commentaries, the Quranic commentaries and the Hadith collections from behind the bookshelf and open them in order to find analogous cases in order to deal with your claim, right? So there's no codification whatsoever. It's based on non-codified Quranic commentaries and Hadith collections. Um, uh, so a system that is, is, is at the extreme of this continuum in the sense that there's no codification at all. Pakistan is a system where you have a British common law tradition, initially quite similar to the Indian constitution, both of which, interestingly enough, ad adopted this idea of directive principles from the Irish constitution, so a large part of the constitution that was actually aspirational, without institutions being created on how to sort of deliver on these goals. One of them in Pakistan was the idea that uh, Islamic law should also be the basis of law, but it was part of the directive principles, and so uh, the, the council that was to be created in order to make sure that Islamic law was actually implemented was not implemented because it was not a, a judiciable, um, a, um, um, a, um, a, a, no, sorry, uh, you, um, it was not, um, can you say it again? Justiciable. Justiciable, exactly, yes, thank you, justiciable, yes. Um, then we have the Afghan constitution, which we just heard about, um, uh, a combination of British and Soviet style legal cultures that were then imbued originally with Shafi and, and under the Taliban with more Wahhabi elements. And then we come to the Iranian about which I will talk uh, in more detail here today, which is mostly a French style legal system installed in the 1920s and 30s that after the Iranian revolution then in 1979 was Islamized. So what I want to underline here, there's no such thing as Islamic constitutionalism, right? It's Islamic constitutionalisms uh, that are extremely diverse. And again, can, uh, even neighboring countries very often can learn quite little from one another because either they have a different co colonial legal past or they have different Islamic legal cultures that are prevalent. Uh, and also, I would like to stress that none of these is a theocracy. Iran is the one that comes closest to it, but in none of these cases do you have actually a religious scholar who entirely dominates the legislative process and the policymaking process. And you will see why that's the case in Iran in a moment. So it's a great diversity that also partly explains why there's actually very little emulation of constitutional models within the Muslim world, which is something that's quite puzzling, right? Especially in the context of the Arab Spring, one would have expected that there is great sort of study of, of uh, other Islamic um, uh, legal systems in order then to think about how, in the case of Egypt, the, the system could be further Islamized. In Tunisia, of course, there were similar voices to that effect as well. But there really is very, very, very little emulation of constitutional models within the Muslim world, and there's certainly no archetypical model. So I decided I will not speak about these six different models and sort of give you, you know, two minutes on each, which would just create a whole lot of sort of complexity, but also confusion. I will spend more time talking in detail about the Iranian. And the Iranian is, uh, is uh, quite uh, important for a number of, of um, reasons. So first of all, Iran is really the most systematic attempt to build an entire legal system uh, on a civil law system. So the idea is that you codify everything. The 1979 Iranian constitution elevated Islamic law also as the most important source of law, but different from Egypt or Pakistan, the idea is that you codify and you Islamize every single part of the legal system, right? So family law, corporate law, penal law, banking law, everything is codified. So there's actually very, very little discretion left over to the judge in a courtroom because ideally it is very, very, spell, very in great detail spelled out um, uh, you know, what legal standards apply in the case of criminal law, what the, what the crimes are, what the punishments are. There, so much less discretion than you would find 
in, uh, in other Islamic courts, for example in Egypt, uh, for sure in Saudi Arabia, where, where things are not codified in that uh, regard. Secondly, it's also very interesting to talk about it, of course, against the background of the, of the situation that we just heard in Afghanistan, because even though these are neighboring countries, Iran and Afghanistan, the legal cultures could really hardly be more different. So we heard a, a presentation where there is a, a, a great belief also in non-state law, right, and alternative dispute mechanisms. You really find none of that in Iran, and it's not just a, a result of the 79 revolution. I think we would also have <coughs> found that already in the 1960s and 70s, which has something to do with the great legitimacy of the state. There's a lot of contention about the regime, right, and there's a lot of political opposition, but the state, the legitimacy of the state is really quite undisputed. And even Islamic scholars will regard the codification of Islamic law as something positive because it really elevates Islamic law to state law and will not see this as necessarily a source of corruption, which are sort of prevalent arguments that you hear elsewhere, right? Very often, even in Indonesia, I would find uh, Islamic scholars who will say, uh, no, we don't want Islamic law to become part of state law because that means it will be corrupted, it will be diminished because people actually don't really regard state law as very authoritative. That's not the situation in Iran. State law is is considered uh, really uh, the, the supreme normative source, if you will, and which has a lot to do also with the welfare state. The state is really a, a state that delivers a lot to its citizens, that has one of the best education systems in the world. As you will know, the Sharif University that sends all its graduates to the PhD programs in, 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 in physics and, and other hard sciences in the United States. The, the medical system is very good up to a point where there's medical tourism from the Muslim world into Iran. So the state really has a legit legitimacy, irrespective of whether you like the regime or not. And I think that has a great bearing on this belief in, in having a, a, a great confidence in, in state law. Okay, uh, just one final remark. Uh, I, I was very struck by, by the presentation by Alexander Filipov on, on Wednesday because I think what is similar in the Russian and the Iranian cases there is, of course, no rule of law, but there really is an attempt to create a rule by law. Right, so um, what we see in Iran is really an attempt to formalize as much as possible. So shifts in power dynamics. Um, if one institution becomes more important than another, you find that this becomes formalized later in law. Uh, and that is something similar that, that Alexander highlighted to me in a conversation we had, is that you have authoritarian rule, but not by circumventing the law. You actually try to formalize authoritarian tendencies in the law in order to uh, enhance their legitimacy. It's really a, a strong rule by law uh, culture. I will not go into the sources because uh, this is part of a larger book project where I also have chapters on how individual court systems work and so on. So I just want to give you uh, an impression of how the system works, then how we got there, how it has changed, um, and, and then conclude with some final remarks. So it's not a theocracy because you have Republican and you have religious dimensions, right? Uh, the most important electoral institutions are the parliament that is elected every four years, uh, the president who is also elected every four years, and the assembly of experts. And that is a, a, a very important clerical council of 86 members who are elected every eight years and who actually elect the supreme leader. The supreme leader stands above all the branches of power. It was Ayatollah Khomeini until he passed away and now it is Ayatollah Khamenei. And he is in many ways the informal political supreme authority but it's very interesting, right, that he theoretically is actually elected indirectly by the people. The people elect the assembly of experts, and the assembly of experts, these 86 clerics, elect the supreme leader. So it could become a system that opens itself uh, on, on the basis of this constitution. It could become uh, more internally competitive. That is something that reformers tried to do in the 1990s. However, the issue is that in all of these elections, a certain council, which is really the guardian of the constitution, the guardian council, screens all the candidates, right? And that's how the system sort of keeps its internal consistency, if you will, because access to these electoral institutions is always filtered through the screening by the Guardian Council that decides who can run for elections and who cannot. So usually only clerics are allowed to run for the assembly of experts who already believe in either the legitimacy of Khamenei or, or another very conservative candidate who will not put the system as currently practiced into question. The Supreme Leader, in turn, um, um, uh, appoints most of the people on the Guardian Council. He also uh, heads the, uh, the armed forces. Most importantly, he appoints the head of the judiciary, who in turn also appoints all of the head judges. Um, and he appoints another council, about which I will talk more in a moment. So you have the 90, 290 member majlis. Uh, at the moment, there are 11 women. You always have between 10 and 15 women in this 90, 
290 member parliament, you also have five uh, different religious groups that are represented each with one representative, so it's really more of a symbolic, rather symbolic integration of religious minority representation. This is the important Guardian Council, which screens every single piece of legislation that goes through the Parliament, right? And so the Guardian Council really, apart from screening these electoral candidates, has other, two other important functions, which is to screen legislation with regard to consistency with the Constitution and consistency with Islamic law. Uh, not all of the Guardian Council members are Islamic um, uh, jurists. Six of them are secular jurists, meaning they're mostly trained in constitutional law. They haven't undertaking the training in the religious house the religious seminaries, which is sort of a training that takes about 15 years where you are trained in all the fundamentals of, of um, Islamic law. But six members of the Guardian Council are trained with Islamic law and they have veto power over the other six. What's uh, very interesting about this Guardian Council is that they are constantly in touch with Rome, with the clerical center of Iran. Many of them reside in Rome and the clerical center of Iran where you find uh, the most outstanding ayatollahs, the religious uh, leaders, uh, constantly publish legal commentaries and uh, drafts for legal reforms. Uh, there, there are a number of journals where this is taking place. You have this whole sort of discursive field of ayatollahs and religious scholars who are not part of the Guardian Council but who are engaged in making propositions for legal reform and the Guardian Council is constantly in touch with them and consulting on their writings as also are other members of the political system. So uh, just briefly how we got there. Um, uh, it's a, it's a picture that represents sort of the three major visions of the revolution. You will all be familiar with the fact that it was a very participatory revolution whose outcome, of course, like most revolutions, was unforeseeable. The constitutional, the liberal constitutionalist wing was very strong. Mehdi Bazargan was the first president of Iran who actually resigned by, because he was so outraged over the uh, occupation of the, uh, of the American embassy and the fact that Khomeini didn't call the, on the students to, to withdraw. Uh, so he represented uh, the judges who had been very strong in the human rights struggle in the 1970s against the Savak, against the security police of the Shah. Bani Sadr, uh, the first prime minister, who was um, represented a more modernist Islamic uh, vision for the state where you wouldn't really have a role for the traditional ulama to play a role, uh, but where parliament, uh, engineers and doctors and so on would decide on what Islamic law would be. And you have Ayatollah Khomeini who uh, represented the vision of a state um, that um, uh, where Shia authority has a particular place. Now, the idea for many participants in the revolution was of course also that once the Shah can be toppled, there could be a return to the 1940s, right? Because between 1941 and 1953, one can say Iran did have that kind of constitutional system that Matthias Heidegg outlined yesterday, really a parliamentary democracy, multi-party system, um, uh, an independent judiciary, uh, a free, uh, free media, free press, uh, that was then brought to an end um, with the foreign sponsored, but of course also at home supported reinstallment of the Shah, the Shah's son. So, what's very interesting about um, the constitutional process is that Ayatollah Khomeini actually agreed to a draft of the constitution. He suggested that this draft would be submitted to the people in a referendum that did not include the idea of Eloyat al Fahri. Yeah? Velayat al-Fakhi is the idea of the guardianship of the jurist, um, that the, the highest Shia authority would also uh, fulfill functions of the highest political authority, which is something that he rather vaguely had developed in his Karbala lectures in the early 1970s, but he really had not written a blueprint. I think sometimes there's this idea today that Khomeini in, in sort of developed this entire system, as you saw it a minute ago, in his Karbala lectures in the 1970s. That is far from the case. His, his comments on Islamic government are very, very generic, uh, are very vague, and, and the idea is just that he feels the ulama have a particular responsibility in making sure that the rule of law is just and that they are the ones who are best qualified to identify what the just law is. So he agreed to this first draft of the constitution, which was mostly based on the French 1958 constitution, which had uh, the idea also of the of a French of the Conseil Constitutionnel, which later became the Guardian Council. But very importantly, like the French Conseil Constitutionnel, there wouldn't have been abstract judicial review, right? There would only have been judicial review if it is requested by the president or by the head of the judiciary or the public prosecutor, as as is the case in France. Uh, in this in this Guardian Council, in the first draft, the Mujtahids would have been in the minority. They would not have had veto power. And most importantly, there wasn't I at all the idea of the supreme leader. The Velayat al the supreme jurist, was not part of this first draft. And of course, there are many um, citations of, of Khomeini where he says, I will return to Rome, as he also did when he returned to Iran. He did return to Rome, to Rome in order to teach and wanted to resume his teaching duties. And it's then sort of in the turmoil of the constitution that a lot of his allies called him back and said, no, no, you have to go to Tehran. You have to install order. This 
revolution is getting out of hand, whatever they may have you know, understood by that, depending on your political allegiances. Uh, but, but there are some indications to suggest that he was really quite fine not playing a political role in this uh, newly uh, created uh, Islamic um, government. Uh, importantly, there was full equality between men and women, and the, the whole idea of Islamic law only came in Article 66, which is extraordinary, right? Because you always have the repugnancy clause usually in the first five or six articles of any constitution. That the idea that is, uh, our law must be based on Islamic law usually comes in the first five or six clauses. Here in this first draft, it only came in Article 66. So he wanted to, he suggested that this be submitted to the people. However, it was actually the um, constitutionalist wing that said, wait a minute, we need the Declaration of Human Rights as part of our constitution, so we want to strengthen the liberal principles further, and, and secondly, this is a participatory revolution, we also have to make sure that all the different factions are actually part of the constitution-making process. How can we expect a constitution based on a revolution to have public legitimacy if it is not based on a participatory constitutional process? Uh, at this point, Parliamentary Speaker Raf Sanjani, who later became the president, I, I'm sure many of you remember him, is actually the one who co shot a warning shot to the constitutionalist and said, be careful what you wish for. Uh, and he was exactly right. Um, surprisingly, he, he's not at all a Democrat, but he had, uh, at some po point in the Islamic Republic, he really had very interesting foresight. Um, so the final draft that was decided in this more participatory constitutional body that then came together in the fall of 1979, where two representatives of Khomeini really took on uh, the leadership, uh, is, the, uh, is the one that then created the system as I showed it to you a few moments ago. All laws must be based on Islamic criteria. The parliament cannot enact laws against Islamic principles. The Guardian Council establishes by majority vote whether that's the case. In the absence of codified law, uh, judges have to rely on uh, fatawa and Islamic sources. And finally, the Islamic nature of the system cannot be amended or changed in the constitution. So according to Article 77, the system cannot be changed. There are some very interesting tensions that were created as a, as a result of this. I just want to highlight one of them to you, which is the one about popular and, and, and dual sovereignty, two articles that come right after each other in the constitution where Article 56 suggests the people are to exercise the divine right, right, because they've been endowed by this by God, so God directly has endowed people with their sovereignty, which is quite interesting because it's not really a Shia idea. You actually have this idea of the ulama being the intermediaries, but somehow they got this into the constitution, which was still part of the constitutionalist wing that had this in the first draft, but this is then followed immediately in the next article that says, the Velayat al Amr, so the, super, so the supervision of the supreme leader, uh, is, uh, uh, is part of the system, and basically he stands above the three branches of power. So you have a separation of powers, but you have the supreme leader who stands above these three. And there are other interesting tensions, uh, I won't go into the whole category log of fundamental rights that you find in the 50, 1958 French constitution are there, but then they're all endowed with sort of limitations with reference to Islamic criteria. But one thing that's really important to highlight is, of course, that this was not just a sort of constitutional revolution, but also a revolution in Shi jurisprudence, because the idea is in, uh, that the Velayat the, al-Fakhi, the, the guardianship of the jurist, really only kicks in, first of all, in family law, uh, when you need legal representation, widows and orphans, uh, so legal subjects that are not, that have no full legal standing, need representation by usually their father or uncle, but if that father or uncle isn't there, the head of the family, then they can call on a mujtahed, on a Shi alim, to represent them in court. That's the idea of the Velayat al Amr originally. Khomeini expanded this to encompass guardianship over the entire society, not just those who, according to Shia law, don't have legal standing in courts. He elevated it from the limited private to the far more extensive public realm, right? Because it's no longer about what we would call family law today, but it's about the entire organization of the public sphere. And he concentrated it outrageously, really, in one individual, namely himself, which is the reason why this created also a lot of opposition among the leading ayatollahs of the time, it's something I've written about separately, which is really quite fascinating, how many leading ayatollahs withdrew in the 1980s from this system, uh, because they were just absolutely enraged by the fact that, politically, Khomeini had placed himself above them when they had just uh, similar scholarly credentials and maybe even a greater following and a greater basis of religious uh, funds to draw on. Uh, so really a revolution in Shi jurisprudence that, that took place here. <coughs>
Now, the system has undergone uh, uh, fundamental changes, and that's part of its success because it really adapts to, say, to changing social conditions. And I would also say it's quite responsive to certain societal needs and also responsive to political pressures, which explains its stability until today. Uh, the idea was that Islami the Islamization would then be trickling into all these areas of law, right? Family law, corporate law, penal law, and that the parliament would do it. However, the parliament, of course, was entirely overburdened with this idea because most parliamentarians were not trained in Islamic law. So they would constantly pass drafts that the Guardian Council would then reject. The 1980s is a, is, a, is a period of deadlock, combined, of course, also with the idea that the Iran-Iraq war was taking place at the same time, which channeled a lot of resources elsewhere. So the first important deadlock was over the land reform, where the, the parliament wanted to uh, basically, uh, the parliament was always stronger in, a, in, in economic redistribution. The Guardian Council, however, represented landed, aristocratic, clerical uh, interests and vetoed the redistribution of land. So it's, it's also a little bit of a class struggle of a more egalitarian-minded parliament versus a more elitist-minded guardian council. And here they found this idea of zarurat, emergency ordinances in Islamic law, which allowed the parliament to say, well, we actually don't need everything to submit to the guardian council. We can circumvent the guardian council if we pass certain laws as emergency ordinances. Again, this was Rafsanjani's idea. It's really quite, uh, quite genial in order to circumvent this veto by the guardian council. A second deadlock was about the labor reform, again, a similar list class dimensions here, uh, where it was decided that um, Islamic contract law is, is a part of private law and actually doesn't need to be submitted to the Guardian Council, which is also really a surprising argument because the Guardian Council should screen legislation with regard to both private and public law. But they decided in 1987, after very, very intensive strangling, that um, labor law reform would mostly be pursuant to Islamic contract law and that is really a part of private law and this has to be agreed between employers and employees and therefore wouldn't be subject to the Guardian Council veto. The most important um, uh, turn to pragmatism, and I would call these two elements that I just described already as a turn towards pragmatism, the most important one was in 1988 when an idea of maslahat was invoked, which is not part of Shi'i jurisprudence, right? You know that there are the different Sunni schools of law and the Shi'i schools of law. Maslahat has always, for 1,200 years, for 1,200 years, been rejected by Shi'i jurisprudence as allowing for too much leeway and unpredictability into uh, uh, legal interpretation. Khomeini, in 1988, published a letter where he said, uh, with reference to maslahat, public ex exigency, we can maybe also call it public order, but the real translation is, is exigency. With reference to maslahat, one can circumvent the most important Islamic principles, even the five pillars of Islam. He went on record as saying, if I think it's in the interest of maslahat public order not to pray, I can order the Iranian people not to pray. He didn't do it, but he said it's possible. Uh, so again, a complete break with Shia jurisprudence. Uh, but a way in order to um, allow for a greater idea of pragmatism um, guiding the legislative process. So, so an expediency council was uh, elected that can circumvent the Guardian Council, and Khomeini is the one who appointed it, and now it is Khamenei, so it's, a, it's an entirely executive-driven appointed council, not necessarily clerical, there are some clerics, there are some non-clerics on the council, that now act as a mediation council in the case of deadlock between the parliament and, um, and the Guardian. So, um, I just, uh, this is the Guardian Council. So, but as a result of this introduction of Maslad, which represented a complete reorientation, if you will, in the constitutional culture, the constitution was amended, even though there was no amendment mechanism. It couldn't be amended, but they amended it anyway. And this was just before Khomeini passed away. It also has a lot to do with the idea that he still had enough clout in order to engage in this quasi-illegal amendment process. Um, so uh, the Expediency Council was formally uh, uh, made part of the Constitution. It became a constitutional body. Um, it was decided that the, the position of the Prime Minister would be done away with a number of other uh, institutional reforms that were supposed to enhance the efficacy of the system. But I just want to highlight to you uh, one idea that I think that is just illustrative of, of sort of how legal reform can work. So. Um, as I mentioned, family law was, was, was Islamized, and um, so after the revolution, the marriage law was, the marriage age was reduced to 9 and 11, 9 for girls, 11 for boys. When the parliament came in, the reformist parliament in 2000 under President Khatami, that really instituted a number of very important, interesting changes in order to strengthen the rule of law, but also the general human rights situation. 
The Parliament suggested to raise it to 16 and 18 years. The Guardian Council rejected it and said, no, 16 and 18 years is not in accordance with Islamic law, it's beyond the age of maturity, we can't do it. So it was sent to the Expediency Council, right, to this newly created council. The newly created council, this Expediency Council, is uh, also very much in touch with the legal scholars in Rome, and they are constantly asking, can you give us some uh, legal commentaries on this or that question? We, you know, we will discuss it, we will weigh it. And uh, there are a number of high-ranking legal scholars who would have lended their support to a marriage age of 16 and 18 years. It's really not a question. You have a lot of very reformist-minded ayatollahs who have written sound treaties on how you can raise the marriage age, and of course also other matters such as uh, prohibiting uh, torture in the prisons and so on. Anyway, the Guardian Council the of Expediency decided to ignore all of these reform-minded male scholars because they were so lucky to find a female ayatollah. You do have a few female ayatollahs. This is uh, one I've written about, uh, who is um, progressive in some ways, but with regard to her family law perspective, she's quite conservative. So she's actually the one who said, well, ideally it should be 9 and 11 years, but in some exceptions you can argue that it should be raised to 13 and 15 years because for all sorts of medical reasons now, uh, the youth become later more mature. It's an interesting argument, but she had a whole treatise of, of how one can argue medically that maturity has actually increased today compared to the time of the prophet. And therefore, uh, her legal treatise was then invoked, and in the end, uh, it was decided that the marriage age would be 13 and 15 years. So I just wanted to give you this example of how there is an exchange between the legislative process and the religious scholars, and that there are not only men, but also women taking part in this process. Um, so to close, I haven't, I, I've talked a little bit about this. I hope you got the idea that there are authoritative inspirations that are taken from non-Islamic constitutions, mostly the French, and if I had talked about the earlier Iranian constitution, you would have seen it even, even more strongly. Um, what I want to highlight is that the constitutional process is highly contingent, right? I think you, you saw that uh, the outcome was, was far from foreseeable. This comes back to this Bielefeld group that we had on religion and constitutionalism, where we looked at a number of constitutional processes also in, 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 in the context of the Arab Spring and saw that the outcome is highly, highly unpredictable, uh, also in the case here. Um, but then that, that one has to see that um, um, the institutional setup is not really reflected of Shi'i fiqh, so we cannot talk about um, Shi'i constitutionalism in the sense uh, of, of being representative of Shi'i writings, it's really a mix of secular and Islamic principles and it's highly responsive, it is, is being changed as you go along and it has become highly pragmatist which again I think is part of uh, the success of the Islamic Republic in terms of its stability. So.